Okay, to be 100% honest with you and fair, it has been a hot minute since I wrote this book. It was supposed to actually be put into print and the publisher that I was working with at the time decided that they wasn't gonna do any more print books. So I ended up with my rights back to it, which was fine. Um, I haven't really tried hard to get it put back into print, but here are some of the things, and I'm just gonna kind of read some of these tips to you um, because I really want you to understand what this book is and what you would be getting if you decided to purchase it. Okay, tip number one. It's called Secrets to Storing Preserved Foods. Whether you can freeze, smoke, brine, or use some other method of food preservation, there are some things you need to know to keep your food safe and fresh. First, make sure you store your food in a way that keeps pests out of it. Field mice, flies, and a host of other critters will ruin your food if they can access it. Keep all of your containers well sealed. Use a large freezer or metal trunk if necessary. If you're hanging your food to store or cure, be sure no pests can get into or above the area. Keep all food in a dry, dark, and cool area. Remember, pathogens can grow in warm, moist conditions. Some pathogens you won't notice until you get sick. If in doubt, toss the food. That is the safest thing to do. Canned food is generally good as long as it's sealed. If you open it and it has mold growing in it or a foul smell, toss it. Make sure all food is cooked to the proper temperature and that it is at the proper temperature before you eat it. Keep your food preparation and storage areas clean. Sterilize canning jars and storage jars. Use brand new lids. Safety comes first. Use hot pads and the proper canning supplies, such as actual canning jars to can in. Storage jars are not made the same way today that they were years ago and therefore are not safe to use for canning. Lastly, enjoy the food you preserve. Have fun learning new techniques. Pass the information you have on to others so it is there for future generations to enjoy. Now, that was just tip one. Tip two is knowing how much food to store. Um, and I do give charts. Tip three is um, a stocking up tip for the first eight weeks of the year. And I take this uh, week by week. So I tell you, uh, like for example, week four is a good time to continue to stock the medicine chest with products such as Band-Aids, antibiotic ointments, ACE bandages, steri strips, and other first aid needs. Now, here's the deal on that. The items are in order of what may possibly be on sale, the, the general average of what different places put on sale for different weeks. So it is there for you as a guide. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be 100% true in the area that you live in. So what you need to do with these lists like this is to think about them, look and see if that's on sale in your store that you shop at. And if it is not on sale in the area that you shop, the stores you shop, look for what is on sale, go through the list, Find out what week it should be and do a swap, okay? Because what you want to do when you're stocking up is get the best price you can possibly get. Buy one, get ones are fantastic for doing this. Or the buy 10, get the 11th free. You know, you wouldn't have bought that 11th item anyway, so why not put it back for your, your storage? Okay, tip four is stocking up weeks 9 through 16. Tip five is stocking up weeks 17 to 23. Tip six is stocking up weeks 24 to 31. And so you get the idea. Um, chapter two would be various food preservation methods. So I give you a tip on curing. I give you a recipe for a brine cure. I give you a tip on sugar curing. I give you a dehydration tip along with a recipe for dehydrating potatoes 
and how to make homemade scalloped potatoes. I give you a tip on oil as a preservative, um, salt as a preservative, smoking. Chapter three is about canning. So of course we have a quick canning tip. Um, we have a tip on canning vegetables. Um, let me read that one to you. Vegetables require more heat exposure because there's a higher chance they could have harmful bacterial spores. This is the reason why a pressure canner is used when canning vegetables. Choose vegetables for canning that are at their prime and preserve immediately. There are two packing methods typically used for canning vegetables, the raw pack and the hot pack. The raw pack method is used for uncooked raw foods. This method is best for foods that may become mushy if they're overcooked. The hot pack method is used for firmer vegetables since the food is pre-cooked in water. The raw pack method takes a few more jars than the hot pack method. However, either method will work for most vegetables. Use a good canning book that tells you what methods you can use and how long to process the food, as well as how much pressure your canner needs to hold during processing. The Ball Blue Book is a great beginner's guide. Now, with that said, as you move on in your canning, I like um, the complete ball book of home preserving. I have all the ball books, though, so um, every time they put a new bigger one out, I usually go and get it. Um, I have tip number 17 is fruit canning tips, tricks, sorry, tricks. Um, and this is just stuff, um, you know, do you have to peel it? What's the easiest way? Um, how you can prevent fruit from browning? Uh, I have some tip number 18 is some time savers that I have learned along the way. Tip number 19 is a recipe for maraschino cherries. And let me tell you, these are really, really good. Um, tip number 20 is for canning cakes. Now, I know that some people are going to say, oh my gosh, you cannot can cake. Yes, you can. It is recommended not to keep them on a shelf. You can can them, you can eat them, or you can put the cake in the canning jar in the freezer. You could also take it out of the canning jar, but you know, if you want it in the canning jar for a presentation to make it pretty, but you need to store them in the freezer. Now, short term, you could store them in a dark, cool place. Like say you're going to bake a bunch of cakes and at the end of the week, you're going to eat them, but it's going to take you, you know, all week to bake those cakes. Then most certainly a dark, cool place is going to keep those cakes okay. It's just like you would do with a regular cake you baked if you left it set on the table, except instead of leaving it set on your dining room table or your kitchen table, put it in a dark, cool place, sealed up, of course, so that there's less chance of the sunlight getting to it and it's sweating in the jars and going bad. Okay, chapter four is on root cellaring. Um, I have tip 21 is on root cellars. It does include the uh, temperatures with the humidity. So for example, uh, cool and moist, which would be within the 40 to 50 degree Fahrenheit range with an 85 to 90 percent humidity range. You can store things like cucumbers, cantaloupe, watermelon, and ripe tomatoes. And even if that area is not a root cellar, you know, if it's a basement, a closet in an unused room, um, wherever that area that meets those conditions are, those are some of the foods that you can store without refrigeration in those areas. Um, chapter five is odds and ends. So like tip number 22 is food and profit from small acreage. And it talks about things like, you know, for a family of six, you need to raise 50 broilers at a time and butcher them every six to eight weeks. 
This will keep your freezer full of meat. Um, okay, uh, don't forget vegetables and herbs. These are important money-saving items. If you can grow all of your own, you will save quite a bit. You can also sell your extra seedlings. Um, tip number 23 is estimated per plant yield. So, let's say that you are growing some broccoli. You could expect one to three pounds of broccoli per plant. Or maybe you're growing some cucumbers. You could expect 10 to 15 cucumbers per plant. That's going to give you a general idea of how much you need to plant. You may get more, you may get less, but it's going to give you a general idea. Um, tip number 24, produce more by extending the season. Tip number 25 is how to make your own root beer, complete with recipe. Um, we have tips on making vanilla extract. We have an entire chapter on cooking with wood. Um, there is tips on wood for smoking meat. Um, for example, for a slightly sweet fruity flavor, try apple or cherry. This wood is good for smoking chicken, turkey, or ham. So, and it lists a number of different types of woods. Um, there are tips for cooking on an open fire, cooking on a wood-fired stove, building an adobe oven, complete with what you need and instructions, and materials you need and instructions. There is how to make a solar oven and some solar cooking tips. There is a tip on baking bread in a solar oven, complete with the recipe. Um, solar cooked vegetables, solar cooked meat, complete with recipe, solar cooked dessert. Again, there's a recipe there. Okay, chapter eight is on baking essentials. Homemade yeast cakes. You know, a couple years ago, nobody could find yeast any place, and people were panicking because they also couldn't find bread. It is so easy to make your own yeast at home. Now, it takes a little bit of practice. But you can make your own yeast at home, and if the store is out, you know, so what? You still have yeast to make bread with. Um, there's a tip on making sugar from sugar beets. And yes, I have done this. Um, liquid stevia is in there, including the conversions from sugar to stevia. There is a tip for homemade honey, because yes, you can make your own honey. It certainly isn't as good for you and as nutritious as the honey that honeybees make. But if you're in a pinch and you need some honey, you can't go to the store or go raid a beehive, here's some tips on what you can do to make some right in your kitchen. Um, homemade baking powder recipe. There's also a no corn baking powder recipe and my light just went out again. Um, tips on storing eggs. Citrus zest. Did you know you could make that yourself? Um, making artisan breads. Sprout bread. There is a recipe for making your own crackers. There's a recipe for homemade peanut butter. Um, herb butter recipes. Um, so, for example, a good herb mix for butter is tarragon, chervil, dill, chives, mint, and a dash of lemon juice. Mix those herbs together, mix them in with your butter, uh, shape your butter, put it in the refrigerator to uh, firm up, or put it in the freezer if you want to make a bunch up and just freeze it. It'll be good in the freezer for six months. Uh, Rosehip butter. Did you even know that was a thing? Um... Okay, so why do I have two tips on peanut butter? See, this is why, oh, I'm sorry, because the first one was homemade butter, and the second one is homemade peanut butter. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, guys. Okay, chapter 11, cheese and ice cream. There's tips on making cheese, including a very, very easy way to do this using milk and vinegar. You won't taste the vinegar, and literally you can go to the store and buy a gallon of milk if you want to try this recipe. 
Um, okay. I also included my Marvelous Goat Cheese Spread. This is some really good stuff, guys. Um, it's a little bit spicy, but it's very, very good. A recipe for homemade cottage cheese. Uh, tips on making hard cheese and, a, and how to make a cheese press. So, um, okay, it's more about the cheese press than, I know there's a recipe for Colby cheese too. So there you go. You can make your own cheese press. You can make your own Colby cheese. Um, a tip on easy homemade ice cream, a tip on ice cream cubes, a tip for lime mint sherbet, and this is good. Um, my best ever individual jar of pickles. You can make these one jar at a time. They're good. They're spicy. Um, a ketchup recipe, barbecue sauce recipe, and these are canning recipes, guys. A taco sauce. A sweet and sour sauce. It is so good on pork. A chicken wing sauce. Um, a hot and spicy salsa. Now, let me tell you. If you don't like hot salsa, just skip over this recipe. But if you like hot salsa and you complain that the stuff at the store isn't hot enough for you, you're going to love this. Um... Okay, and then I have a uh, chapter 13 plant yield charts. So tip number 66 is figuring out plant yields. Because again, you have to know how much to expect. Experience is the best teacher here. And, and that's what I basically tell people. But there are ways to get a little bit more out of your plants by taking care of them. Um, you know, like I said, there's numerous plant yield charts online as well as in print. So once you pick a plant yield chart that you're pretty happy with, you can't just go by those numbers. You need to actually keep track. So, um, and some of my homesteading binders and some of my gardening binders have sheets in those that you could get if you wanted to, and you could actually track how much each plant or each packet of seeds or however you want to do it, how much you actually get. Um, tip 67 is planting for high yield. Tip 68 is plant yields per acre. Okay, so for example, if you planted carrots, you should get 360 crates that are 75 pounds a piece up to 450 crates. If you plant potatoes, these are light potatoes, okay? You should get 250 bushels, which would be about 60 pounds, up to 500 bushels, okay? So, um... You know, it varies, but this will give you a really, really good idea. Um, okay. Um, I have a vegetable crop yield chart again. Um, tip 69 is a fresh vegetable canning yield chart. So, like, um... When it comes to beans, green or snap, one bushel will produce 12 to 20 quarts, depending on how tightly you tack those. I pack those, not tack them. Guys, I'm having a day. Um, tomatoes, whole. One bushel will produce 15 to 20 quarts. Okay. Uh, peas, one bushel will produce between 10 and 20 pints. I also have a fruit yield chart. So like pears, you will get two to three bushels from out of a tree. Um, grapes, you should get two bushels. Now, like I said, this isn't, this isn't absolute guaranteed. It's just to give you an idea. 
Um, I have a fresh fruit canning yield chart as well. So like sliced apples from one boost bushel, you will get 15 to 20 quarts. Okay, and then I have a chapter on fruits, nuts, seeds, and edible flowers. So tip 72 is on passion fruit, and maypop is one that grows here in Indiana. That is a passion fruit. It can be a little bit invasive, but you can grow it and you can use the seeds and the skin and the leaves of the plant if you want. Um, this tells also how to germinate the seeds. Um, there's tips on harvesting walnuts. There's tips on edible seeds, you know, like sunflower, bread seed, poppy, or pumpkin seed. There are tips on edible flowers, as well as on how to candy flowers. Um, chapter 15 is grains in the garden. So we have tip 76 is grains in the home garden. 77 is amaranth. And that is one that if you get it going, it will self-seed, at least here in my garden. Um, there's a tip on cooking amaranth leaves with the recipe. Quinona, oats, wheat. Um, there's a recipe for popped wheat. There is tip number 82, make your own cereal. And I have the recipe for whole wheat cereal flakes. Um, chapter 16 is grow your own herbs. So on tip 83, I give you reasons to grow herbs. I give you window seal and container herbs. You know, tips on those. Herbal cooking tips. Herbal baking. Herbal candies with a recipe. Um, herbal seasoning. I give you a recipe for Old Bay seasoning, for seasoning salt, Cajun seasoning, and Italian herb blend that is oh so delicious. And these do have salt in them, some of them, but if you don't want that salt, just omit it. It's it's not going to make or break the recipe. Um, tip 89 is on herbal teas, and I tell you, um, like rose hip, it's high in vitamin C and may support healthy kidney function. Now, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not licensed. So, I put this in there, but you're going to have to do your own research and talk to your doctor and decide what you think for yourself. Um, chicory root is used to add a natural sweetness to tea. It's also a coffee, coffee substitute, um, which I don't have in there. Um, probably should, but don't. Okay, tip 90 is herbal vinegars. Okay, so let's say you want to make an herbal vinegar and you have a red wine vinegar, but you don't know what herbs would go with it. You can just pull this up and right here, thyme, rosemary, hyssop, fennel, oregano, garlic, basil, tarragon, marjoram, mint, dill, black peppercorns, allspice, clove, lemon thyme, savory sage, bay, cinnamon, mustard seed, cumin, parsley, burnet, borage, cilantro, and ginger root. So think about what you're going to use that herbal vinegar on. Choose your herbs in any combination of those and put them in the red wine vinegar. And then I tell you how to actually make it. Um, herbal wines. And I do give a recipe for dandelion wine. Um, old time herbal remedies. So, I give a few here, like um, for poor appetite, nutmeg. Stress, rose scented geranium, lavender, and St. John's wort. Again, I'm not a doctor, but these are some herbs over the years that have been touted as working for these type of symptoms. So, again, use your own judgment and talk to your medical doctor if you have questions. Um, cotton and fiber. I give some tips on growing cotton. Tips on growing flax. Um, fiber animals. I talk a little bit about sheep, cashmere and cashgora goats, and angora goats, and angora rabbits. Shearing. Just a few quick tips. Carding. I just basically explain what it is and how to do it. 
Um, spinning. I talk about spinning wheels and spindles. And I tell you how to make a spindle and how to begin spinning. Uh, weaving. Just a few quick tips. Edible flowers. We cover pansy and viola. Queen Anne's lace. And we have recipes with these roses, including my rose petal jelly and rose hip candy recipe. And basically that is through the book. So as you can see, there is a lot of information packed into this for the price. And I feel like for the price, it's well worth having. Yes, you need to print it out and put it in a binder someplace so that you have these at the, you know, at will as you want to look at them. Um, at least that's what I would do. Again, this is a PDF, so if you'd rather have it on your device, that works too. Again, this is in my Etsy shop. I will, do have a link to that in the description below. Um, the name of the Etsy shop is Exotic Gardening Farms. And we're located here in Marion, Indiana. And I hope you will go check this book out as well as the other items that I have in there that um, you may just find more than what you thought you needed. Anyway, guys, uh, please subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, comments below. Thanks for watching and have a great night.